So welcome everybody. We're gonna kind of pick up where we left off last time, which is about halfway through the slideshow for uh, chapter one of your book. As I was just mentioning, when I go through these PowerPoints, it, it's not a replacement for reading the chapter, uh, but I th think it's you know good to hear things from your instructor's viewpoint. And I like to highlight the things I think are important. One thing that's kind of interesting about you know working with web technologies is it's it's a connected technology right and so when we use computer systems and i want you to think about this like if you have a desktop a laptop a phone a chromebook whatever it is you're operating that machine it has an operating system so most of us use windows computers right so we run some version of windows and then we load software onto that machine that does specific tasks for example Microsoft Word, right? You launch that after you've installed it and you can type up a letter, right? And so it's a tool that does a certain thing, but it requires that you have the computer, the operating system, and the software installed, right? And it's a process. In the old days, you know, we used to get the software on CDs or diskettes, or these days you download your software and install it and use it. The web is a little bit different. The web uses a browser. So I'll just bring my browser up here really quick. So here's my browser. I'm running Chrome right now. And a browser is something that we kind of think of as kind of like the universal client. Right? This is kind of a weird concept because it really, if you think about most of the stuff you do on your computer, and just stop and analyze this for a second, maybe aside from gaming and typing up a Word document, almost everything you do goes through a web browser. And what we do as web programmers is we design stuff that works inside that environment. So once the user has a computer, doesn't matter what kind, and they have a web browser, they can access your content if it's out on the internet and it's delivered through a network. The network that we use to deliver the information is called the internet, right? Uh, and believe it or not, the internet still, I would call, say it's in its infancy. It's still kind of a new technology. It's been around, like we talked about last time, since 1969, right? The same year man landed on the moon and we had a little talk of like, which is really more important in human history when you really think about it, right? Um, and then we compared that to the, the printing press and the impact that the printing press had on society, the ability to reproduce words and then people learned how to read. The internet has that same impact, right? So once you have that portal through your browser, you can access anything that's out there as long as you know how to get to it. Um, and it's powerful. It really is. It, it's, it's game changing, really. So when you're developing for the web, you're kind of unlocking that door, but also you're working through this universal environment that operates on top of a network. Now, we don't have to be networking experts to be web people, right? But it doesn't hurt to know a little bit about how the infrastructure works. So typically when we connect up computers, I mean, most of us just like turn on the machine, we connect to the Wi-Fi, you know, the password, you rarely even mess with that stuff at home. You know, maybe you're the person at home that sets up the router, maybe you're not. I mean, I don't know how you're, situation is uh i certainly am but my kids have figured out how to do it too right which sometimes <laughs> isn't a good thing you know it's like hey you shouldn't you didn't have to reset the device just to you know whatever but all right so what's happened now though is what we used to have in like places like this like schools and businesses is we would have everything is all wired up you got computers they're plugged into switches and routers and hubs and whatever and then those wires lead to a wiring closet, which leads to another, which then leads to a connection out to the internet. And then through your web browser, typically you're connecting to the world. At home, we kind of have the same kind of setups. In fact, you might have maybe a setup that's sort of like that, right? Like we have a router, um, we maybe have a, a switch, maybe multiple devices. Some people have cable modems. It, it really kind of depends. These days, usually if you're getting internet from AT&T, or Spectrum, those are the two big ones in our area, um, they usually give you one device that does all of that, right? And I want you guys, you should know this actually, that if you're on one of those, well, I don't know if it's true for AT&T, but it's absolutely true for Spectrum. Spectrum allows you to buy your own equipment. Spectrum's got this great little game. Every, every month when you pay your bill, they make you pay for the router every month, like 10 bucks a month. Yeah. 
it's like that's like the old days where the phone company used to rent you your phone for a dollar a month and like seriously <laughs> you know that, that thing's like it's been sitting there for 50 years you guys have been collecting all that money for all these years for a phone that's worth like you know 20 bucks or something yes e yeah that, that's true right so you probably shouldn't use your own equipment unless you're a little bit tech savvy but if you are you can get much better equipment than what they're offering right uh, not that their equipment is bad uh, but what i do at home for example is i have a cable modem and then i have my own really high-end router um, and you have to buy off of a, they'll give you a list actually of ones that are approved because and you should know this that even though you own the equipment they can take control of it you know which also means they can get into your home network so just beware right so there's really no privacy you have to really lock down your stuff at home just like you would in a corporate network by the way right if that's kind of revelatory for you you really need to read up on the stuff yeah so if you have uh so even if you have your own equipment spectrum for example can take control of your router okay so the why well what if you don't pay your bill they, they can shut you off is why you know but then that gives them other levels of control all right um networks usually are, are wired or wireless uh and we have this like terminology that we kind of throw around like lan and wan and lan stands for local area network that's usually a network within a building or a house right um, on this floor of uh, this building that we're in, we have one network. We kind of toured it last week, right? Uh, this whole network is considered part of one LAN. We have other campuses, so we can connect outward, um, and those are actually dedicated hardwired connections that we that Gateway pays for. Nobody else uses those lines, which I think is kind of interesting. So those are called wide area networks, usually over like a geographic range of anywhere up to a few hundred miles. But sometimes it can extend further. Pretty interesting. Um, the internet itself is, you know, been around for a while and it's been expanding and continues to expand. What I think blows a lot of people's minds is, and, and this is really true even to this day, even if you're visiting websites in foreign countries, most of those websites are on servers here in the United States. Isn't that kind of weird? Right. So you might connect to like a server in I'm just like, you know, throw a country out like Dubai or something, and that server might be here. So it's pretty fascinating when you start to think about it that way. Um, we talked about this concept of client server, and if you heard me carefully, you heard me call the web browser the universal client. In the old days, before we had personal computers, and you would work in a, let's say, a corporate or enterprise environment, very often they would have this big, super powerful computer called the mainframe or a mid-range computer or something like that. And it would be in a closet in the basement in the building somewhere, and it was giant and huge and special people had to run it. Uh, and then they would wire up what we would call dumb terminals. It was just a screen and a keyboard. And you'd get the stuff on your screen and what you were really interacting with was the big machine in the closet, right? Now, the internet kind of allows us to do a little bit of that because a lot of times when we connect to an application, and a really good example would be like email, right? So we bring up our gateway email, which is Gmail. Somewhere out there on the internet, Google's got servers that run our email. We don't really even know where, you know? It could be anywhere. Uh, and then we use our web browser as the client or think of it as a portal to access that system. So even though we have a computer that can stand on its own without the internet and you can game on it and do art on it and whatever you do on a computer, we still have the capability to kind of also do that, you know, dumb terminal kind of approach where we're connecting to a service somewhere else where really all we need is the screen and the keyboard. Okay, a mouse too, right? So kind of interesting. So you're like, so Gmail is a great example of you're running software in your browser that's not on your computer and that's a client the web browser becomes a client so that, that's kind of a, an interesting thing um the way that this like whole concept works this client server relationship is pretty important and that's what we're going to kind of explore when we do ftp today is you know normally when you learn how to code 
um, and a lot of the instruction you'll get online or at other schools is you'll write a bunch of HTML code, you save it, you open the file in your browser, and there it is. Oh, oh boy, you made a web page, but it's not really on the internet, right? It's on your computer. And what we are going to do here, because we, we feel this is essential, is we're going to have you take that file, move it up to Gateway's web server, and then have you connect to it. And that's the way you're going to submit your homework most of the time for this class. So you're going to create your web page, you're going to upload it to the server, you're going to test the link and make sure that it works, and you're going to send me the link. So it's not, not going to be like you're handing me a document or handing me a file. I'm just going to go to your web page and look at it. And then I'm going to right click view source and look at your code that you, you typed up, and then I'm going to grade your work. And, it, and the reason we do this gives you lots and lots of practice um, in moving files around because that's what professional web programmers do. We upload stuff to servers all the time. Now, once again, we call the client really is our, our browser, right? And they talk about, you know, the different uh, types of browsers that we have. Of course, there's also Firefox and Safari and Brave, and there's a whole bunch of browsers. You know, we, we are very narrow minded, you know, typically. Uh, Chrome is kind of the de facto browser right now. But it wasn't always that way. I remember when Chrome was like, you know, two percent of market share, and it's like, what's this thing? <laughs> you know, Internet Explorer was the bomb, or Firefox was the bomb. Um, and I might have you change your mind about like which browser you use, because when it comes to doing web work, they're not all equivalent. You guys will find out pretty quickly. Um, we talked last week how here in the classrooms they decided to remove Chrome from all the computers and oh my God, people freaked out because so many people use Chrome. Um, and for web developers, it's kind of the primary browser, right? And Firefox, a close second, right? Um, I don't know too many web developers that use Edge as their primary tool. You know, Internet Explorer, well, forget about that. We, even Microsoft pokes fun at Internet Explorer now. Right. Pretty sad. Um, the other here's another acronym you guys will want to kind of uh, notate HTTP hypertext transfer protocol is the network protocol that we use to transmit web pages over the Internet. So there's a way that we transmit the data for web pages that is different than the way we let's say transmit data for a database connection or for streaming a video, for example. Um, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, and then when you have the S version, which you see here, that indicates secure, right? Um, and that means that your transmissions are encrypted in transit and hypothetically cannot be cracked. That is not entirely true though. So don't, don't, uh, don't think you're completely safe. You know, there, there are ways to usually kind of hack around things. Um, what a, a web client typically does, as was alluded there, is it, re, it you go to the Internet, you type in a URL, press enter, or click on a link, and it goes to the server, requests a page, and then it comes back to your machine and you can see it. And now we're going to take our one minute joke break with Jerry Gifford. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Why do Ty and I love these things? These whiteboards. Why? They're remarkable. Ooh. So Jerry does that to me every time we're teaching at the same time. He always walks in and tells a joke. If you online people are wondering, yeah, they are remarkable. Thanks, Jerry. All right. From the web server standpoint, what's kind of interesting, and that went into the recording too, which is kind of silly, but now it'll be on YouTube tomorrow. So uh, what the web server does is it waits. It's a computer just sits there and waits for traffic to come in from the internet and go, hey, do you have this page? Can you send me the code? Thank you, right? And I want you to think about this, that what the web server sends back to the client is simply text. That's all it sends back. It doesn't send back images and video. Well, sort of, but text is really what's coming back. And then your client, the web browser, is what reproduces that code and makes, makes it visible on your screen. Um, lots of different terminology. Here's, here's another one. 
uh, mind types, and, and this is something we don't really throw around terminology wise that much anymore, but in the past, before web browsers could natively, let's say, do like audio and video, there was a time you'd have to get plugins for stuff. There was even a time where we had to do plugins for images, <laughs> but now it just happens automatically, right? So not a huge concern anymore. Lots of protocols. So we talked about HTTP, HTTPS, those are transmission protocols, but there's many, many, many different ones for all the different technologies. And I think we mentioned this last week also, FTP is one of those protocols. Email is a protocol. Um, it, and there's many different ones. In fact, whenever we transmit information over a network, one data connection to a network. So let's say this one ethernet cable coming to my machine or my one Wi-Fi connection within that connection, there's 60 over 65,000 individual ports or channels that you can transmit information to and from simultaneously 65,000 on one internet connection or one network connection. It's pretty interesting. The web uses one port. Does anybody know the port number for web? It's actually kind of handy to know. It's port 80, by the way, for whatever reason. So it wasn't one of the first ones they used, but <laughs> the 80th one or something. But they chose that port and, and by default, um, web transmissions are on port 80. When you run HTTPS, it's uh, it's different ports, usually port 443. Uh, but that, those are not things you really need to memorize. I would say in the long run, you probably want to know at least port 80, because that's actually pretty helpful. All right, so let's talk about FTP a little bit. We're going to kind of dig into that uh, once we get done with this presentation. Um, but this is really an important tool for web developers, because the file transfer protocol is a more efficient way to move files around the internet than HTTP is. And, and one of the reasons why uh, it was developed in the first place, it was developed before web pages were around, interestingly, because people would still transfer files before there were web pages. And now that we do have web pages, it's uh, still the web developer's favorite way to be able to upload stuff to a server. Right? It just works really well. Um, question I sometimes get is, can you use HTTP to transfer files? And the answer is, yes, you can, but it is not as efficient. It, it, has a lot more overhead to it, uh, interestingly. A lot of stuff that you don't think about as being protocols, uh, email is one of them. Um, and so they have things like SMTP. So if you've ever configured maybe an email client, I, maybe you guys don't do that anymore because everybody does Gmail or Yahoo or whatever. Um, but in the old days when we would download separate pieces of software to do email, you would have to know these settings like, okay, so is it SMTP is your send mail? And then POP or IMAP is your incoming and knowing which one you had and how to connect to it was important. Uh, and if you ever have to configure an email client, these are settings you sometimes need to know. What's kind of cool these days though, is if you're using any of the major mail services on any of the major operating systems. So if you're on Mac OS or the PC or on Windows and you connect to like Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook, or you know any of those kind of standard ones, it's all kind of automatic. You don't even have to know the stuff. In the old days, that wasn't true. You'd have to know like the exact address and the port number and right, passwords. And it was kind of like a little bit of a thing to figure it out much easier these days. But all of these technologies technically are separate protocols and they use their own port in the connection to do the sending. Kind of interesting, I think. Um, okay, going back to the whole HTTP thing, we already talked about this. Um, Okay, here, actually, this is kind of a nice little graphic here where it says like as the client, so the, your web browser on a computer or a phone, a tablet, whatever. You hit a link or a web address, it goes to the server, it finds the server, looks for the thing that you're asking for, and hopefully it's there, and then the server sends it back, your client renders it on the screen. Right? HTTP is for normal web tra traffic, HTTPS, secure. Right? Uh, we are moving into an era where uh, search companies like Google, I mean, they pretty much set the standard, I guess, at this point, are preferring HTTPS traffic over standard HTTP traffic. And we'll talk about that as we go uh, and what the differences are. Now, when you start to dig into 
to networking and learn about it as a technology. And it really is a pretty fascinating field of study. Um, as web developers, we don't necessarily need to get into a lot of specifics with this, but as I mentioned, I think it doesn't hurt to know, right? So if you're, we don't, like in the web program, we don't teach a lot about this, where if you were taking classes across the hall with CSS or networking or cyber, they would they dig really deep into this stuff, right? Like how IP addresses work and why they work and all the different layers that happen within the transmissions. But the fundamental technology that we use in our networks these days is called TCP IP. And it's really this layered approach. And let me explain why there's like two acronyms stuck together. IP stands for Internet Protocol. It is the part of um, the networking infrastructure basically that handles the addressing scheme. So any device that's on the Internet, including the one you're connected to, uh, right now, or connected to the session with right now, um, has an IP address assigned to it by the network, typically, that it's connected to. So, for example, I'm on the campus Wi-Fi, and when I connected to the Wi-Fi and authenticated, it issued me an IP address. And the reason that happens is so that we know how to route the traffic to your machine. So, like, if you make a request from the Internet, how does that know where to go back to? Kind of an interesting thought right um, it's because of that addressing scheme so when i'm connecting to a server it's the same way even though we might connect to a website that has for example a name like coca-cola.com in truth there's a, num a number underneath that that takes you there and i think that's pretty fascinating some kind of neat little tricks i can show you over time and and, and here's a, a real common one i'm trying to type uh, get my command line up here and so this is some old school you know kind of like the command line stuff but very interestingly for whatever reason the yahoo company has left their ping open now, if you guys don't know what that means that means i can go to a command line like this and type command and i can send a signal out across the internet where it looks up yahoo.com and then it bounces the signal back to let me know that it was received and then how long it takes. Now, look at the results from that. This is kind of interesting. Um, so I typed in ping yahoo.com, and then what it did is it did a lookup. So yahoo.com is actually 74.6.231.20. Got that memorized? Right. No, right? So that's why we have web names and why people buy domain names because nobody remembers the numbers, right? And so that's a pretty critical step. So anytime we're typing yahoo.com, there's a server somewhere called a domain name server that looks it up, says, oh, you're looking for this IP address, you know, 7462320, it will take you there. And then the reply that comes back from that machine, and notice they sent back 32 bytes of data within 21 milliseconds. That's not too bad, considering the servers are probably in California. Like if you were gaming, you know, 23 or 21 millisecond ping would be pretty good, right, gamers? <laughs> so we get up into the hundreds where it's a problem, right? People are shooting you before you even have a chance to you know, pull your gun out on them or whatever. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting that you can see that. Now, most people, if you ping them like this, they don't, they don't even allow the pings anymore. Because once you know the IP address, you also have a mechanism to attack the server. Pretty fascinating. Right. So Yahoo leaves it open mostly as an example, I think, uh, kind of fun to do. All right. Now, the IP part of TCAP IP gives you the addressing scheme. So the address for the machine and then the TCP part stands for transmission control protocol, which actually handles the, the software layers, the actual like mechanical work of sending the information over the network. When you study networking, and um, forgive me if I don't remember your name, uh, Vidal. Yes, sir. Yes, because you're you're in the cyber program, right? Sure. And and you study this stuff. Um, but TCP/IP has what is it? Seven layers. The OSI model. Yeah, the OSI model. Thank you very much. Um, and different things happen at those different layers, and the stuff that we create will operate at the upper layers of that in this class. There are ways to actually program for the lower la layers too, uh, interestingly. 
Um, what I always find really interesting about information that travels over the internet is that every time we have, let's say a document or a video or an image and it transfers across the internet, a really interesting thing happens to it. So I have, um, and this is kind of a, a weird example, but I have this like little piece of a business card. I, I just tore off this. I, I wrote an IP address on here. This is like a long story, but so let's say this is a document and I'm going to send this document over the internet. All right. If I, if I was sending a letter through the mail, I would put this in an envelope. I'd write the address of where it's going, the address from where it came, and I put a stamp on it, right? Otherwise, I won't take it. I seal it. I got my information in there, drop it in the mailbox somewhere. Some, somebody picks it up, looks at the address, sorts it, does it, and it gets to where it's going. But it all travels in one piece. The internet does not work that way. The internet is operated on a technology called packet switching. And what packet switching does, it's kind of interesting because they, they figured out in the old days, hey, when we do a phone call and I, we connect a circuit from a phone you know, to uh, the central office to another phone, that's a dedicated line that's connected and the signal is traveling through that line and getting to the other end Nobody else can tap into that except the government, <laughs> right? Little sideline there, but um, and listen to that communication stream. And when I'm talking and I stop talking for a second, I'm just thinking, right? And the other person's not talking. That line is still active, and you're chewing up 100% of the connection. That's a circuit switched connection. Packet switching said to itself, "Well, it's like that's great." But that means that anytime we want to connect the computer, we have to have all these dedicated lines. That's really inefficient. What if we shared the network and took all the information, and here's what they do. Take all the information and they tear it into little tiny pieces. Each piece, and this is kind of the point of this graphic, has a to and from address, the information, uh, a thing called TTL, time to live, um, and they break it up into a million different pieces with little index numbers on them. And then they take that information and, you know, just to be kind of funny, cast it out over the internet. All the little pieces of the information can travel to the destination, not in the same route or in the same envelope, but can take a thousand different pathways to get there. They get to the other end, they're reassembled, put back together, and you see it on your screen. And if it doesn't happen within half a second, we're frustrated. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just astounding technology. But the whole reason they did that is because that way, you know, this little piece of information can travel over that same pipeline with millions of other pieces of information, all with their own destination. They share the same transmission channel, and we can put more. It's kind of like, you know, if I was driving to Chicago and they made a road just for me, that would be a circuit switch. If it's a packet switch, it's the interstate. Everybody travels the interstate. Kind of interesting. Um, but that that's how packet switching works and uh, really, really kind of revolutionary technology they came up with in the 1960s, by the way, right? Um, the, you know, internet protocol, um, has been around, you know, for quite a long time. Um, it really uh, shares a growth uh, along with the Unix operating system. So the Unix operating system, which powers most of the internet, by the way, um, and all of our Android and Apple and <laughs> a lot of our devices and servers, um, that really, you know, operates on this technology. And they built a technology to network and they built the operating systems to network to communicate. Um, interestingly, these were not the only protocols that were out there. Back when I started in IT, we would have competing protocols. So we'd have like, we'd be running like a Novell network, which used IPX SPX. You guys never even heard of it. We used to play like Doom on the network where I used to work. And we play over that network because it was faster than TCP IP. But for whatever reason, the internet kind of went out and this technology kind of went out. So this is kind of the only one that happens now. But it wasn't the most efficient protocol, very fascinatingly. So the IP, uh, you know, this uh, talks about exactly what I just was mentioning. We use numbers, 
So here's the IP address for Google if you guys want to try to hit it. So you can type that number into your browser and it should take you to Google, right? You would never remember that though. Um, we also talk about the whole concept of domain names and why we have them on the web. Now, for the most part, and maybe you guys are like me, in the old days, I used to go to my address bar in my browser and I would type, you know, coca-cola.com, right? And I go to the browser. Now, usually what I do is I bring up the browser, just do a search, you know, whatever it is I'm searching for, I'll just type Coke or whatever, right? And find the first link that matches and click on, it, right? It's just, it's just easier than typing in a web address, but it's still important because nobody remembers the numbers, right? And it's kind of a thing that if you're running a business or a website that you buy a really cool domain name. And we have lots of options for those. As you kind of progress through the program, um, you'll get deeper into these fields of study. But like right now I'm teaching a capstone group, a group that's finishing and working on real client projects. And we're heavily vested in this because the client needs to buy a domain name and they need to buy hosting. And what domain name do you get? What's a good one? Where do you buy it from? How much should it cost? You know, et cetera, right? Uh, we will have a unit later on in the course where we'll kind of revisit that uh, a little bit. Some more terminology here that's pretty important. We have these two, like I think most of us, right, have heard of a URL. Is that a fair assumption, right? And that's usually the, the web address that we type uh, into a browser. But I, I want to make a, a clarification here because the book makes kind of a point of this. The URL basically tells you where the thing you're looking for is located first on the server and then where on that server, like what folder or what construct gets you there. Um, the URI, by contrast, is an identifier. And this is often a great area for students that, that maybe you don't see this right away. But as we learn to do the stuff in, that we do in this class, you will see there's a correlation between a URL will have the name of the server, your account name, and then your folder substructure to get to the file that you want to reach. So when you look at the URL, I can, I can look at it and go, oh, it's on the Apollo server or the Prometheus server, and it's in you know, John's account, in his Web1 folder, in his Unit3 folder, in his Fish Creek uh, case study folder. Right? And there's this whole hierarchy, and I can tell you exactly where on the machine it's located just by looking at the URL. A URI, by contrast, is an identifier that seemingly points you to the same thing, but really is symbolic in nature. And then once you hit the server, the server guides you to the actual location. And so most websites that are dynamic, I'll just give you an example like Facebook, for example, um, you never really hit the real resource because everything you're seeing on the screen is not in one document. It's a, it's a whole bunch of different software working together to build the screen you're looking at. Very different kind of thing. Right. What we're learning now is what we call static HTML in this course. Right. But you have to understand this before you can build on top of it. You know, OK, so here's an example. You look at a URL, the pretty typical. So the first part of it and most of our browsers now, right, when you have a web page address up, you don't see the HTTP anymore because it just confused people I mean, is really the truth of it. But we should always know it. And interestingly, whenever you copy a URL out of the address bar and paste it somewhere, the HTTP follows because it's actually important. Right? But the first part indicates the protocol. So HTTP, then a colon, forward slash, forward slash. There's many other protocols. It's not the only protocol. Remember that, right? So FTP is a protocol, for example. Then we have what I would call the main part of the domain name. That's the, the blue underline here. So this would be webdevfoundations.net. And this is actually a real website, by the way, the author's website uh, where she puts a lot of like resources and stuff. So that's a domain name. It's, it's a combination of a name, then a dot, and then what we call a top level domain. In the old days of the internet, we had a couple of basic ones. You'll see that on the next slide. Uh, now we exist in an era where it's possible, if you have enough money, to get a custom top-level domain. You know, so if I wanted, I could do like .takis, for example, you know, and I could sell my chips, right? 
<laughs> just a joke. Um, the other part, which is kind of interesting, is sometimes before a domain name, you have a, per, you know, like a preceding name called a subdomain. And in the old days, for web pages, as a rule, you would always go www dot whatever, right? Functionally on the internet these days, it is not necessary if things are configured correctly. But you will see people create subdomains and really what subdomains are, are kind of like an aliasing structure to help drive traffic to specific resources. So I might have one, one that's a database server and I might call it like db1.takis.com or one might be a web server. So that's a www or whatever, right? But the def... Right. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people don't even bother with the subdomain part of it, but it's just another way to kind of separate resources. There was a time on the internet that it mattered a lot because the web was not the primary way you surfed. That's really kind of weird to even think about. There was a, another technology called Gopher that was a lot more popular. You know, I do the back in my day thing, but that's how it was, right? And that was one way you could differentiate it. Once you get past that, then we start looking at the rest of the URL, like after that slash. And what you have is, in this regard, if it's static HTML, there's a folder on the machine called chapter one and a file called index.html. And you won't want to do an asterisk on this one. That's the default name for all home pages on the internet, by the way. All what? That's the default name for all home pages on the internet in terms of actual file name. And that's a, that's a hard one to learn. I want you to also notice something kind of interesting here. You guys see any capital letters in this? You do? Where? No, there's no capital letters, right? The other thing that happens on the web, um, it's not that capital letters don't count. We're highly case sensitive, but you kind of, when you do static HTML, the convention that most web people use is everything is lowercase. Once you get into subsequent classes, and you'll see when that happens, uh, then you can start putting an uppercase letters in. But if you do use uppercase letters in folders or file names, it has to be precise when you hit the web. It might work on your local machine without, but on the web, we talked about this last time too, right? If it's not perfect, it doesn't work. It is not forgiving at all, right? It's got to be perfect. <laughs> all right. We talked about those top level domains. So when the internet first started, we basically started with these, the ones I just highlighted. So they, they figured out, well, they're either a company, an organization, uh, they're networking, you know, giant like AT&T or something. It's the military, it's the government, or it's education. And all the domain names would fit into that category. And so when the internet first popped out and got really popular, there was a gold rush for domain names. So people would go out and they would buy domain names with .com and then people would, you know, buy them from them. And that's still a thing, right? But now that we have so many and they're custom, it doesn't really matter so much anymore. But, um, oh my God, like just a really good example. So I, I keep saying Coca-Cola.com. That was one of them that some guy just bought because he was a fan of Coca-Cola. And then Coca-Cola had to pay him millions of dollars to get the name from him because he bought it first. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> right? And there's people that still do that. Yeah. You go on GoDaddy. Yep. Let's say I purchased one of the names, ABO. The word changes. It's kind of like stock. It is. That, no, Vidal, you're totally right. So what Vidal was saying is that he, and you know what, I've done the same thing where I, I used to buy names and just sit on them because I thought they were good names and then people will make you offers on them. But services like GoDaddy will actually tell you what they estimate the worth is, right? So let, let's say you bought like a thing like joesrestaurant.com and then all of a sudden Joe opens up a restaurant and wants that name and you own it. You don't have a website on it. You just own the name and he has to buy it from you to get it, right? And then of course that depends on what the offer is and how big the company is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting because I, I, you know, in my personal web work, when, when I would get clients, I would often coach them when we got out of the, you have to use .com 
mindset. And a really good example was we did our work uh, for a client up in Mequon and they were opening this place called like on the way cafe or something like that. That was the name of it. And then they wanted on the way cafe.com. Of course it was taken, you know, like everything.com is. And I'm like, you know, there's a dot cafe. You could get on the way dot cafe. Or if you think of the Fiserv forum in Milwaukee, if you ever look at the building, it says Fiserv.forum. That's their web address. It's not Fiservforum.com. And so, like I said, you can, if you pay enough money after the dot, you can put whatever you want. But a lot of them are already pre-created. Some of the special ones do cost more. All right. Kind of a, a fun thing. Another interesting thing they did is um, when they started running out of names, they also decided, you know what? Every country should have its own code. There's 174, 75, 78, something like that, countries in the world. Um, and each one has its own two letter top le level domain. Yes, the US has dot US. But for example, what is dot UK? All right, that's easy. Dot JP? Dot yeah. AU? Australia. There you go. Dot WS? No clue. <laughs> I'm not even sure what it is. Uh, here's a good one to know. How about dot CN? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, CA is Canada. CA is Canada. CN is China. Yeah, um, but every country on the planet has one. What what one that's particularly interesting is this one dot TV because you see a lot of people using that one, um, and it's this tiny little island in the Pacific, and I forget like what they're called, but they have like maybe like a thousand people that live there or something, and their whole game is selling dot TV addresses, and it was really big you know twenty years ago. I don't know if it is uh, anymore. Um, yeah, so you can actually look all this stuff up. Um, I, I think what's fascinating, though, is like they figured all this stuff out so long ago, right? Um, and it still works. Right? There is a, a organization that oversees all the domain names. They're called ICANN. Um, they're located at um, originally from the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Right? We talked about this last week. That's where their centralized database was. Um, just before Obama left office, he passed a thing saying that it can no longer be strictly controlled by the US. So up until five, six years ago, the United States controlled all the internet naming planet wide. A lot of countries did not like that. And so they made it an international body. Thankfully, it's still run out of the US though, right? But all around the internet, there's a whole bunch of servers called domain name servers or DNS servers. So every time you type in a web address, it finds one of those servers, looks up your name, and takes you to the IP address. That's the job of those servers. There are a minimum of 13 locations where they have the main DNS servers that are always operational. The thinking is one goes down, there's 12 others that kick in, right? There have been times where there's been multiple ones down at the same time, mm -hmm. like during cyber attacks and stuff. Doesn't happen that often. Vidal? I was gonna ask you, what are some of your favorite like hosting? Good question. Um, my favorite hosting provider is me. So and and you know what, Vidal, uh, you know, as you take classes with me through the program, you you'll hear my stories a lot. But I was, you know, 25 years ago, somewhere in that range. I didn't know any better, and I was like doing a lot of this stuff. And I actually would pay for like T1 lines and I would host client websites myself. And then I figured out this is ridiculous and then would just pay web hosts. Um, and then I got into the business of, of doing that, of selling hosting and domain names also, usually working off the top of GoDaddy, but working with other firms too. Yeah. It, there's a whole scheme to it. Like it, my, my thinking was as a, young developer it's like hey every time i do a project i'm referring business over to somebody and i get nothing for it and then i'm like well i can become a reseller and so i would just sell the services through me they still get the same level of service and support 
but I would get a piece of, like insurance sales. I'd get a piece of every transaction. And to this day, that's one of these little side businesses I have and I keep earning money. I don't really do much. I just <laughs> watch the money roll into my bank account, you know? Yeah, so a lot of little clever ways like that you can make money on the internet. Um, right, that shows how the, uh, the DNS system works, but whenever you type in an address, it goes to that DNS server and then it tells you where the IP address is, then it goes to the web server and then it comes back. And like I said, it happens so quickly, like if it doesn't load up instantly, you get frustrated. And to me, that's mind boggling, especially if you're pulling in stuff that's on the other side of the planet. You know, I mean, it's just astounding uh, in that regard. Um, all right, so now, now let's turn our attention to the languages we're about to learn. And I think, you know, as you learn how to code or whenever you learn how to code in any language, um, it's really, I think, important to understand like where the stuff came from and where it's going to. And I do want to point out that HTML, we call this web programming, markup languages in a way sort of aren't really programming in a traditional sense. They're markup languages that extend from other technologies. The original markup language was this one called uh, SGML, uh, Standardized General Markup Language. And where it comes from, this is really kind of historically interesting, is in the old days, or back in my day, here we go again, right? Um, you used to pick up, you know, we talked about the printing press, right? And what I'm looking for are some images of handset type. And here's great examples right here on the screen. So if you can picture this, if you were picking up a newspaper in like the 60s or 70s or earlier, um, all right, so you were a reporter, you wrote up a story, right? You give it to your editor, your editor looks it over, goes, that's great, let's, let's hit the press. You take it to the press room, and then some guy in the press room, like one of these guys here, would have these like big, like drawers full of these tiny little pieces of lead type, right? Each individual letter is on a piece of lead. And then their job is to take what you typed and take it and, and, and to boot, all the letters are upside down and backwards, and they have to hand set it all piece by piece with spaces and capital letters and the whole bit. And they put it into these things and they, they bind it all together and then they put it into the printing press. It gets inked, paper gets put in, it gets pressed against the paper, re-inked, paper, re-inked, paper, and over and over again. And if you guys were ever in downtown Milwaukee when the Journal Sentinel still used to print that way, they'd have these machines and you could look through the windows and you see these big machines running and each machine was just printing one page, right? They print tens of thousands of pages, but that's how they would do the paper. So why would like reporters have deadlines? Because if they wanted to be in the morning paper, they'd have to get, get it in by like 10 or 11 at night because somebody's overnight is like hand setting the type, printing the paper, making sure it's okay, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mechanical process, all right, then computers come up. Right, so late 70s, early 80s. And they were like, well, we can type up the documents instead of typing it on a typewriter and turning it into this, we can type it up on the computer. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to send it right from the computer to the printing press? And they figured out a way to do that, but they had to come up with a language approach to do it. And so what they would do is like, well, okay, not all the words are the same. Some are headlines. So that's gotta be bigger and bolder. And you know what, this is this is a quote, so we got to like maybe italicize it. So we had italic letters too, or they'd have like the first capital letter is like really big, all that stuff. And they came up with a markup language that they would insert into the computer code that would mark it as bold, italic, heading, uh, paragraph or whatever. And you guys are going to see as we do HTML, that's where the concepts come from. We're just doing it for the screen instead of doing it for a printing press. But it speeded up things and they came up with this language for printing called SGML that did exactly that. The first versions of HTML were based directly on it. In fact, even old word processors, one of the first word processors I worked on, uh, which was like a quirk word processor, if you can imagine that, 
um, would have the same kind of markup. They would have little brackets and you'd put in a, like a capital B to mark for bold and then you end the bold with a lowercase b. It's different now, but that really is still kind of around, right? That um, technology still drives a lot of pre-press operations, believe it or not. Um, now from there, um, what ended up happening is they came up with this other language called XML, which is what we call our universal markup language. It is the markup language that creates all the others. So it's, we call it the parent markup language. Um, and there's a little bit of an interesting history with XML and HTML, because as computers became more important and the internet became more important, what a lot of people realize is like, well, putting stuff up on the screen is great, right? And being able to click on it, but wouldn't it be great if the stuff inside the web browser could behave like all other applications? The problem was, is that HTML was too loose. It wasn't strict enough to operate like a programming language. So they took XML, which was really tight, and then combined it with HTML to form a different language called XHTML. And before HTML5 came out, which is the language we're about to learn, XHTML was what I was coding in through most of the early 2000s. That was the de facto web language. And the reason we used it is because you could do application building with it. And JavaScript would work and CSS would work and you could create applications, not just web pages. And you'll see the difference um, as we do that. So interestingly, um, you know, so this will be an exam question too. What version of HTML came before HTML5? The answer is not HTML4. The answer is XHTML. We went HTML1, 2, they kind of skipped 3, went to 4, then they went to XHTML, and then HTML5 came out. And yes, we are on the precipice of HTML6. And I don't know if they're actually going to even name it that. They might just keep calling it HTML. In fact, a lot of HTML6 is already workable. Interesting. Uh, HTML5 became a standard um, right when I started here at Gateway. So it was in January of 2014, it became the de facto internet standard. Um, and you know, notice they have like, this, this is kind of an old slide, but they already have drafts of six, as I mentioned. Um, and notice how w3.org, remember W3 schools from last week, you guys? So I'm gonna take you there um, right now. So if you go to a browser and just simply type W3 schools, this is the website that's put together by the standards issuing body that declares the formal rules for HTML5 that everybody's supposed to follow, right? Here's kind of news for everybody. These days, people pretty much follow the rules, but 10, 15 years ago, they didn't. Microsoft did it their way. Google did it their way. Firefox was the only one that was compliant, by the way. It still is the most compliant one with the rules. Um, but W3 sets the rules. It's the World Wide Web Consortium. And then they also have the site, W3 Schools, where you can come in here and, for example, learn HTML. And this is the most useful resource for web developers, period, on the internet. There's no other site that compares. Any other site that's out there is not being developed by the site that sets the standards, if you feel what I mean by that, right? So here we're going right to the people that do it and create it. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be learning is overwhelming. I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that. That's how computer stuff is. There's so much information thrown at you. Did I give you guys this advice last week? How are you going to remember this all? Here's the answer. You're not. So what, what you have to do is you have to know how to look stuff up. The beauty of the web, web people put stuff on the web more than any other people <laughs> because we're the people that create it. And so there's tons of information out there that's excellent. This is the best site, you know. I often will think about like, well, I know how to do all the basics in my head, but sometimes it's like, oh yeah, how do I do like a CSS or a flex grid or something like that? And I, I might forget some of the syntax, so I just come in here and look at it and try one of their examples. Um, they have tutorials. Um, you know, I'm just going to give you kind of um, 
an example here, like whenever they have uh, examples, like here's an example of paragraphs, they also have these little try it yourself tools. And I think I showed you this last time, but I'm doing it for the people that weren't here last time. They have these try it now tools where I can code on one side, right? And I hit the run button and it updates on the other side. I don't have to install any tools. I can try the code. I can see how it works. I can see working examples and it's excellent. I mean, it's free, right? There's no cost, right? And so you can look up what all the rules are, what the syntax is. And like I said, don't bother trying to remember it all because you're not going to. And that's really uncomfortable, right? Uh, you know, because you, when you're going to school, it's like you have this mindset that I got to memorize this stuff, man, for the test. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's open book, open note. <laughs> you know, open internet from a friend. I always tell people, it's like, you're not going to remember it. What's more important for people like us is how to figure it out when you need it. And there is some stuff you're going to memorize, right? So people go like, Ty, how do you know all this stuff? How, I mean, well, I've been doing it forever. <laughs> and, every, and every time I do something, I pick up another little piece of information and add it to my arsenal. But it doesn't mean that two weeks from now, I'm going to like, be able to regurgitate it to you. Sometimes I can. You know, but a lot, of the, a lot of the reason I can regurgitate what like happens in this class is this stuff is basics and I teach it all the time, right? But if you're out in the field, you tend to remember the stuff that you do all the time. But there's always going to be a situation where you have to look stuff up. The internet is your friend. W3 schools, top of the list, right? All right, that will end uh, this lecture on chapter one. So we're finishing unit one there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a, a five minute break. When we come back, we're gonna do the FTP thing, all right? So uh, so online people, we're gonna step away for about five minutes. Uh, and you know what I encourage everybody, both in class and uh, online, don't sit in your chair all day, stand up and walk around, get the blood flowing. It's not healthy to sit around all day. All right. See you in five minutes. Uh, let's say at uh, 1256, we'll be back. <laughs>